and then you've had a chance to look at Matthew and Mark because there's a, a great deal in Luke that's not in Matthew and Mark concerning the crucifixion. And so uh, the lesson today is uh, sacrificed and certainly uh, our gospel is uh, revolves around the sacrifice of Jesus that uh, atoned for our sins uh, and uh, the things that went on there when he gave his life there on the cross. Uh, reading uh, from the scripture here in the 23rd uh, chapter of the book of Luke, beginning with the 33, 33rd verse, if you will turn in your quarterlies or your Bibles, we'll read these verses and then we'll hopefully uh, glean some things from them and uh, the gospel of Luke. Uh, beginning in the 33rd verse, and when they were come to the place which was called Calvary, they were crucif there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiments and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a subscription also was written over him in the letters of the Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which was hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justify justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour that there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, unto thy hands I commend my spirit. And having thus said, he gave up the ghost. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this new day, this day which we can celebrate by coming and worshiping you and studying your word. And Lord, we just ask that you... Uh, Give us uh, uh, wisdom and knowledge in communicating these uh, verses, these truths uh, to these people here this morning. Lord, we just pray for your guidance and direction. We thank you for their faithfulness, their faithfulness to you and this fa their faithfulness to this church. Lord, we just pray that you would lead, guide, and direct and all these things, in Christ's name I pray, amen. Uh, in the introduction of the Sunday School lesson that we look at this morning, it talks about one sacrificing their life to save another, and it mentions several different, you know, you can think of maybe soldiers that have thrown themselves in front of comrades to save them, giving their life for others, or maybe uh, a parent. I was watching 60 Minutes there the other night, and it talked about one of the 
people that came to America and his parents, they couldn't afford to send the rest of the family or themselves, and they sent one son, and when he went back, uh, he was of Polish uh, descent, and they had killed, the Germans had killed his parents, his brother, and his sister. And, uh, you know, what parents would do to save their children and firefighters and police and so forth, uh, giving their life for someone probably a stranger. And uh, so uh, the question is, is it worthy of asking, did the death of Jesus on the cross, was it really unique? And uh, the short answer is yes. And uh, the longer answer is that Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross is the very heart of the gospel. And so uh, he came to, you know, and, and Jesus came to earth for several things. And you might say the main thing he came for was to save mankind from their sins. But uh, he came to uh, reveal the Father as no one else could do. And uh, he came to teach and transform uh, the Aramatic, uh, the uh, Abrahamic covenant to that of the new covenant. And uh, then he came to bring uh, deliverance by healing and by uh, casting out demons and raising the dead. He did all of these things, but uh, what he the thing that was crucial Jesus accomplished is tied directly to the sacrificial death on the cross. And so we see this in the, what we're looking at today. He accomplished, you know, the thing that made it unique is the fact that how he could accomplish this when no one else could and the fact that he was the sinless son of God. And so... Uh, only Jesus could accomplish salvation because he alone was the Father's provision to do so. He alone. He was in, it was the Father's plan, and so he was that part. Uh, you hear that, what Jesus said? What Gigi said, who would have thought that up but God? And that's right, Gigi. That's right. And so uh, we see this in Luke's gospel. Now, if you look at Luke's gospel and you look at Ma uh, the gospel of Matthew and Mark, there's a great deal that Luke gives here, some specific verses, but he gives more detail into the crucifixion than any of the other gospel writers, particularly about those two that hung up on the cross, one on the right and one on the left. And uh, he, uh, there is, like I say, if you look at those gospel, different gospel writers, the third gospel, Luke, gives a great deal more detail into what happened there on the cross. Okay, just an abbreviated uh, review of chapter 23, uh, verses 1 through 5, uh, the Jewish relig religious leaders take uh, Jesus before Pontius Pilate, the governor, uh, and uh, uh, accuse him of uh, insurrection. Verses 6 through 12, Pilate attempts to appease the Jewish religious leaders by sending him to Herod Antipas, who would happen to be in Jerusalem at that time. And Herod Antipas was tickled to death to get to interview and question Jesus, uh, but uh, he doesn't condemn him or whatever, but he puts a robe on him, gives him back to the soldiers, and the soldiers take him back to Pilate. Verses 13 through 25, Pilate makes several attempts to appease the, the Jewish leaders. Uh, but, uh, you know, he brings out Barabbas, hoping that the crowd will uh, 
condemn Barabbas. Barabbas, we know, was a rebellious, uh, certainly a, a criminal uh, of some notoriety, but instead the crowd condemns Jesus and releases, and he releases, Barab Pilate releases Barabbas. And so uh, uh, Pilate then releases Jesus to be crucified. Verses 26 through 31, Jesus is so battered that uh, he's not able to carry the cross uh, through the, we know that uh, uh, they made the criminal carry his own cross through all the streets and so forth of Jerusalem as an example uh, that you didn't want to commit this crime. And as they carry, as, as they went through the street, a soldier in front carried a placard saying what, what this person had done. And the, the, what would the placard say? That this is the king of the Jews. Now that placard was taken off of the, of that of the stick probably or the pole that it was put on and it was put on the cross or it was put around the neck of the criminal as he hung on the cross and so uh, uh, and as as I said he was so battered that he Jesus was so battered that he couldn't carry the cross and a Roman soldier tapped Simon of Cyrene and Cyrene was uh, you know Tripoli, and Tripoli is the capital of Libya, and so uh, he was tapped, uh, Simon was tapped to carry the cross. The women weep, they're weeping for Jesus as, uh, as they go along, the women follow, and he tells the women not to weep for him, but to weep for themselves in Jerusalem because, uh, you know, in 70 A.D., Jesus, uh, or the, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. And as I read one commentary, it pointed out that a lot of those people that were left were crucified. A lot of those people when, when Jerusalem was destroyed were crucified. Okay. And then verses 33 through 43 was the dramatic scene of Jesus hanging on the cross between two criminals that were crucified with him and uh, we see that uh, only Luke gives the fact that Jesus prayed for those people that had uh, crucified him or had got him to where he was and only Luke gives that uh, prayer there and uh, so uh, and we see there in that pas those passages that the one of the criminals asked that Jesus remember him when he comes into his kingdom, and uh, uh, Jesus gives the answer that uh, today you would be with me in paradise. <clears throat> and Luke, then finally in Luke forty four. Uh, 23, 44 through 49, Luke notes the timing and the extraordinary circumstances that take place while uh, between noon and 3 p.m. and the fact that darkness falls over the whole area and the veil of the temple that separates the holy place from the holy of holies is, is rent right down the middle. And... Uh, so, uh, and then we see that he, uh, Jesus, commends his spirit into the Father's hands. And uh, we see that people leave that execution there, beating their chest and, and having great grief as to what has happened. The Roman uh, soldier that was at the foot of the cross said that, he certainly was the son of God, and it was a good man. And so uh, those onlookers were probably 
a great number of them followers of uh, Christ. Okay, that's just a short overview. All right, we're going to get into it now. And so we look there in verse 33, and we see the place where Jesus was taken to be executed, and he alone uses the word skull, and from that, uh, none of the others gospel writers, they use Golgotha. And uh, being the doctor that Luke was, he certainly used a, a, a physician's uh, language. And uh, we get that, uh, the Greek term, which we get the English term cranium, is uh, taken, uh, is where we get this, and the Latin basis of the Greek uh, is where we get our term Calvary, Calvary. And so, uh, like I say, he would use a different terminology than the others. Uh, the aromatic term Golgotha uh, is used by the other writers, and if you look through it, you'll find the meaning to be the place of the skull, the place of the skull. And so uh, Barclay, he goes into a great deal of detail in describing the crucifixion. He said that when you, they crucified a person and the cross was a T, but it didn't have the upper portion of the T, usually where they, the person could put his head in sort of rest but usually they didn't have that upper portion of the T, but they laid the cross down flat on the ground and they would take the prisoner or the criminal and, and stretch his arms out and nail his hands or lash his hands. And they, would, they could even nail into his arms and then there was a peg in the middle of the straight piece there, the main part of the cross, and that person was sat on that peg, and the hands, or the feet rather, uh, were sometimes tied and sometimes nailed. But uh, he said that uh, this was uh, certainly uh, an idea that came originally from the Phoenicians, and then it was taken up by the Persians, but the Romans perfected it. And the writer of your Sunday school lesson in the commentary tells about Spartacus. Now, I don't know how many of you saw the movie Spartacus. And he was a Thracian and a Roman and a gladiator. And, of course, he initiated a rebellion, and he was killed in that rebellion. But when uh, the Roman general that had defeated uh, these rebellious group, Marcus Licinius Crassius, and he decreed that 6,000 of those troops, captured troops of Spartacus, would be crucified, and they crucified 6,000 of them. Uh, this was 70 one BC, 71 BC, and they crucified 6,000 of them and they put them on uh, the road, the Appian Way, that was well traveled by all the people. And so uh, this person that was crucified, the cross was put in the ground and the feet, his feet were no more than two or three feet above the ground and that placard was placed around his neck or on the cross. And uh, so there he, he uh, stayed for several days, maybe a week. And he would die from thirst, hunger, uh, shock. You know, what a terrible death. But now Jesus was not like that in the fact that he died real soon. He was crucified at nine. I want you all to see this. And at three, he gave up the ghost. Of 
quite different. And I don't know, evidently that criminal that was with him that asked for him to remember him when he got to paradise died the same way. I don't know how long the other criminal stood on the, uh, sat on the cross, uh, hung on the cross, but uh, you know, we see this. Right. No. Right. Right. And he gave it willingly. Now, one of the things here is that we see the the word that was used for criminal. Uh, Luke used a different word from the other uh, gospel writers in that they use a word that means thief, robber, bandit, or sometimes insurrectionist. Jesus, of course, was not guilty of any of this. And uh, Luke uses the uh, malefactor, uh, meaning doer of evil. Okay. Now, verse 34, uh, we see uh, that, and as I said, Luke is the only one that prays for these individuals to, that God would forgive them. Now, them, who is he talking about? Is he talking about the Roman soldiers, or is he talking about the religious leaders, or is he talking about the whole group that got him there? Who is he praying for? Them is a little bit uh, not clear as to who he's, he's speaking of. And one Bible theologian suggests that perhaps he was... Uh, praying for a broad reference of all sinful humanity for putting him there. All sinful humanity. Okay. And then they, there's no problem understanding they in, in the latter part of that verse in that he's talking about the soldiers. He's talking about the squad of soldiers who conduct the execution. And they divided his garments and cast lots for his raiment. And so uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is mentioned in one of the commentaries is, you know, uh, Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church, he prayed as he was being stoned that, uh, you know, God not lay this thing on them. And, and let, let's just mention a couple of things here in the fact that ignorance is mentioned, you know, uh, throughout. They don't know what they're doing. They're ignorant. And Peter uses that, and a number of other people, Paul uses that to say, you know, these people are ignorant. These people are ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. And Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Okay. All right. And now, there's four groups of people here that are at the crucifixion. Four groups of people. And the first group of people, as we see, were the group that were just standing by. And I, as I said before, probably a lot of these people were followers of Jesus. And there were people probably passing by. This was probably, uh, I've been there and they supposedly show you where uh, this crucifixion took place. They're really not sure. But people passing by in and out of the city, of course he was crucified outside the city, but... Uh, passing that way they would stop and look on this and these were the only people that were not mocking Jesus they were standing there looking at what was taking place but they were the only ones that are not mocking and uh, sneering at Jesus okay and then the second group of people were the religion or the leaders or rulers and they were, uh, if you look at the King James, it says deriding, uh, the ESV scoffing, the NIV sneering at Jesus. They were the religious 
opponents of Jesus who followed the procession, celebrating in a way that they finally are going to get rid of Jesus. And so uh, uh, you can save yourself, but uh, you can save others, but you can't save yourself is what they're saying. Uh, if you really be the Christ, the chosen one of God. And, of course, we know that Jesus had the power to save himself, but he chose not to do that and uh, provide salvation for all those who believe in him. And then the third group were those that were being crucified with Jesus. And so... Uh, the sentence of crucifixion was had been passed on them as well. And one of these individuals we know mocked Jesus the same as the religious leaders did in the fact that they, uh, you know, he, he pretty much said the same thing that the religious leaders had done. And, and so uh, vinegar was offered to Jesus. Now, I don't know how many, I'm a pharmacist, and know that vinegar is acetic acid. Uh, and there's several forms. It depends on apple or however. But the point is made, it was, a, a, it's, the point is made here that it's sort of a, a sour wine. And if you read over there in one of the passages in Psalms, I believe it's in Psalm 61, one, that this was foretold. They offered him vinegar mixed with gall. And uh, so Jesus refuses this. Jesus refuses this. And uh, uh, cheap sour wine drunk by the common people. And uh, so... Uh, this was, uh, uh, it's Psalm 69, 21, Psalm 69, 21. Let's read that verse right here for us right real quick. And it said, And they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And Jesus refused that drink, whether it could deaden it or not. It looks like that maybe <laughs> the, the, the ones that had offered it, the soldiers probably, uh, didn't give it to him to alleviate the pain. Maybe it was to cause him more pain. And so uh, uh, this was what was taking place. Okay, and then, as I said, the, the accusation, it was usually put on the cross. That placard that was carried through the city was put on the cross or around the neck of the uh, individual and uh, John's gospel says that it was inscribed with three languages, the Aramaic, the Latin, and the Greek. And it was those three dominant languages of the Holy Land during the first century. Okay. And the fourth group were uh, a part of the crucifixion scene. And these, uh, as I said, were the people that were crucified with Jesus. And Luke states that one of the malefactors, the criminals, rallied at Jesus. Some insults, it's the religious leaders. The third group was the soldiers. And uh, the fourth group is the malefactors or those two criminals that stood, that were on the cross with him. And uh, one of them railed at, you know, the same idea of, you know, say you, you saved others, save yourself, and us, save us as well, if you can. And the writer of the Sunday School lesson says something really important here. 
is to be so close to the Savior hanging on the cross and to die in sin and rebellion. To be so close and to die in sin and rebellion. He chose the other route. Okay. And so uh, the exchange between Jesus and the second criminal is quite different. And, uh, you know, how, how th there's a different attitude here by that second criminal. And uh, here is where we get maybe the doctrine of divine salvation by faith alone. Divine salvation by faith alone. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And that, that, that criminal hanging there, that second criminal, had that faith. He asked Jesus, you know, uh, to remember him. The condemned man hanging on the opposite side displayed a radical different attitude from the criminal. He's evidently begin to have repentance for what he's done. And so he, that one uh, that's abusing Jesus with his uh, abuse there, language, he rebukes him and uh, uh, mentions the fact, does not thou fear God, saying there are, in the, we are in the same condemnation, punishment, the second man attempts to warn the first that they're both facing judgment before God shortly. Their imminent death is, is certain, and so uh, they're facing judgment. And so the repentant criminal acknowledges his wrongdoing and confesses that two of them are being punished for justly doing the things, and, and the writer points out that this following Old Testament law, you're being repaid for what you did. You're being repaid for what you did. And so uh, justice was consistent with the Old Testament law. Now, uh, he acknowledges that his crime has been serious, and Probably they have taken the lives of other individuals. Probably it is a serious crime. Now, one of the things about the crucifixion was it wasn't intended for the Romans. If you were a Roman citizen, you, you didn't get crucified. Crucifixion was for slaves, for the most terrible criminals, probably that weren't Roman, and for war prisoners. That was who the crucifixion was intended for. And so, uh, you know, but uh, he says we're deserving. We're deserving of death. Uh, Jesus had done no wrong, and he recognizes this. And the writer says, how, how did he have this idea and the other criminal didn't? How did, how did he know? And we don't know how he knew. But he had some idea of, of who Jesus was, and he knew uh, what he represented. And, and we just don't know how he knew. Uh, it's not clear, is, uh, you know, how he knew the truth about Jesus. It's important to emphasize this point that true repentance begins with an honest admission of guilt and sinfulness. True remission of, you know, begins, or repentance begins with honest admission. And so the verse reveals that the, comp the repentant criminal had some degree of understanding about Jesus and his divine mission. Uh, he turns to Jesus and says to remember him when he comes into when you come into your kingdom and and we see that that's repentance has has begun to turn to faith and so uh, 
he mentions this, uh, we saw a different kind of person there. He believes that Jesus would soon be ruling over a better and greater and more enduring kingdom. And uh, Jesus responds to the man expressing the faith with an equally pronounced Verily I say unto you this day, today, or unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, it's really interesting in the point that paradise, the word paradise is mentioned only three times in the New Testament. Only three times. And what paradise is a Persian, a Persian origin. And, and the Persians... If they really, what, what the word paradise meant was walled garden or heaven, walled garden. And if the Persian really wanted to uh, honor an individual, they made that person a person that walked in the garden, a person that walked in the, this commemorative garden. And you walked with the king. You walked with the king. And what better idea of heaven for the believer is you're eternally forever walking in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit eternally. And so paradise is that, you know, meaning wall gardener heaven. And then, as I said, you look at that phrase, with me, and you know that you're going to be in the presence of God, the presence of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And finally, Mark tells that Jesus was crucified at the third hour uh, at 9 a.m. And then Luke tells of the significance uh, of the thing that occurred between 3 and, I mean, noon and 3 p.m. on the cross. The sun failed. There was darkness throughout the whole land. And the uh, cosmic significance of that event, it looks like uh, God just turned off the lights for for. Jesus' death there. He didn't want the people to see what was going on there on the cross. And then the veil that was rent in the temple uh, that separated the uh, holy place. The holy place was where uh, the uh, altar of incense was, the, uh, where they had the showbread and so forth there. The holy place as compared to the holy of holies, which, uh, the, you know, was the Ark of the Covenant rested there. And so that veil was rent, and it indicated the openness that was there now, the openness to the people to come directly to God, not through the, the, the high priest, which only entered the holy of holies one time a year in the Day of Atonement. And so now mankind could come directly to God through, you know, Jesus. And uh, so most Bible scholars think this curtain that separated the holy place was uh, where the lampstand, the incense altar, and the table of showbread were located from the Holy of Holies. And finally, the death of Jesus was unusually rapid, as I said, due to the effects maybe of the scourging that the Roman soldiers did. And one of the things here is the fact that Luke omits what Matthew and Mark put in is, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? They put that in there. Luke omits that. And, and he says, 
Into my hands I commend, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Father, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Now, I'm going to tell you something and, and uh, what Vernon McGee said. He said, Luke being the physician, and, and if you read each of the gospel readers, uh, gospel writers, you notice what it says that all but John say that he cried with a loud voice. He cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Now, Bar uh, McGee says, how many people do you reckon Luke saw die, he being a physician? And I've been around, I saw my father die, and I've seen, I've been close to others, and I've never seen them shout or anything else. And he says, you can bet your bottom dollar Luke had never seen that happen either, or nobody else die with a shout, a shout of tribe. And so uh, we see here that he says, uh, you know, a shout, and to our hands, I commend my spirit. Now, John, in his gospel, says that Jesus said this final word, and it's just one word in the Greek. It is finished, just one word, and he gives the Greek. But that, that John points out that that's the, the uh, end of the conversation Jesus has with God. It is finished. It is finished. Okay. That's it. We're barely, I'm still on time.